First of all, before I go any further, what I'd like to ask is all of you, I hear you're all six formers, you've all made it through a certain process called GCSEs, and um, I'd like you all to give yourselves a round of applause for getting that far. I didn't too, do too well in my exams. Um, and so by the time I was your, your guys' age, uh, I had been kicked out of two schools and two colleges. And so by the time I was 19, um, my most famous photo was this one. Um, yeah, I've, my, I think I might be a bit better looking than I was then, maybe. <laughs> But this um, picture tells a lot of stories. And it, it, it's quite upsetting, to be, to be honest, to, to look at that young man and um, remember exactly how dark a place that person was in. Because five minutes before that photo was taken, um, I'd just been in a police cell and heard um, and been told for the first time that I had been arrested um, for murder. And I can't begin to explain how that feeling is to sit in a police cell and be told by an officer that, you know, we're arresting your suspicion of murder, and um, yeah, that's it. And then they throw you in a prison cell to think about that and to hopefully confess so they can get an easy, quick sentence and put you in court and forget about you. And I was sat there thinking, what have I done? How has it got to this point? You know, because I didn't have some crazy upbringing where, you know, I, was, I wasn't in and out of care, I wasn't some of these terrible stories that you, we've, we've heard. Um, I came from a decent background. I just struggled in school and got into the wrong crowd and started to develop some negative beliefs that didn't help me. And I was more bothered about what my friends thought and what was best and what was in their best intentions and what was in the best intentions of society and the stereotypes that that gives you than what was best for me. And by no means I'm not making any excuses. I've come through a lot of things and I've took complete responsibility. But it was difficult. And eventually, um, what had happened is I'd been out July 31st, 2011, on a night out celebrating a friend's birthday. And I'd been separated from my friends later on that night. And I got a phone call, and some of my friends were calling me saying, oh, it's kicking off, Jacob, it's kicking off. And me back then, I was one of them young lads where it was cool, you know. It was, you, you was a big man if you could back your friends, you know. You wanted to be seen to your friends in your, in, in your neighborhood that you would have their back, you would stick up for them, and that you didn't show any signs of weakness. And that's how you developed your reputation. That's how you became closer friends, through helping each other, but helping each other in a negative way. And so my first, instinct, my first instincts were to run down there and get involved in a violent way. And what happened is I threw a punch and ran away. But the repercussions from that punch um, were felt a month later when the police came and told me that that one punch had left that man unconscious on the floor and he hit his head and he passed away from um, swelling on the brain. So it's got to the point where I'm sat in sentencing, um, I'm waiting to go to court to get sentenced, and you know, my mum's in bits, my whole family's in bits, I'm thinking, this is my life over, what am I gonna do, I've hit rock bottom. Um, and I'm, I'm just a young man from that picture, you know, who's lost all hope in myself, never mind anybody else. And I get, to, I get to prison, and I was hoping for some kind of hope somewhere, 
I sat there in that, for that first night and I can remember um, getting a cold jacket potato and a bit of coleslaw. And I thought, oh no, have I got this long to go? I, I had 15 months to serve. Um, and I thought, I can't do this. I looked at the calendar, I looked at next year on the calendar and realised I still wasn't getting out in that year. And then I just started to have a panic attack. And I haven't told anyone about this because before, all that masculine culture, you don't want to show any signs of weakness. But I sat there in my cell and, you know, came to tears. I thought, I can't do this. I'm not going to be able to make it. And then I snapped out of it. I said, Jacob, come on. You haven't got a choice. You have to make it. You have to, you have to make something of yourself. You have to take it one day at a time. And so I, I did that. I took one day at a time in prison. And but the negative thing about custody is that it makes you a good prisoner, not a good citizen. And so I was having those negative beliefs and values that I was learned, that I learned in my community have been having them reinforced. So prisoners would tell, or my fellow prisoners would be like, oh, I can't believe that that happened to you. I can't believe, you know, your friends got you in trouble and all this other stuff. And I just became becoming more and more bitter, more and more angry. I had my mum my on the phone crying her eyes out. You know, she's lost her job because of what I did. She looked after the children, and because I was living with her, she lost her job. My whole family was falling apart, and I was sat there thinking, do you know what? It's everybody else's fault. Why has all this happened to me? Why i am getting so bitter and angry at everybody else, not taking any responsibility for what I'd done, looking for anybody else that I can blame, and just fueling that anger, fueling all those beliefs and all those values that I had that got me into trouble in the first place. And so by the time I came out of custody, I was even worse than when I first went in. So what do I do? I didn't care. I didn't, I didn't care about myself, so how was I going to care about anybody else? And I had a couple of months where I was homeless and I was stopping at friends' houses, didn't really know what I was going to do. And to be honest, I'm quite lucky that I didn't end up straight back into prison. I don't know how I managed to get through that initial period, but, you know, someone must have been looking over me. And then, a couple of months later, after getting out of custody and being a completely, you know, no two ways about it, horrible person, my probation officer came to me and said, Jacob, have you ever heard of restorative justice? And I was just like, no, what is it? And she said to me that David and Joan, who are the people who are the man who passed away, his mum and dad, have got a couple of questions that they want to put to you. And um, I sat there and I felt, Phew. I've never thought about anybody else. I thought I was the victim. I thought like I was the one who was hard done by. I was the one that was unlucky and, and unfortunate. And all of a sudden, I started to realize that I'm, I, wasn't the big, I wasn't the victim in all this. There was people out there who had been hurting more than me, hurting more than my own family. And so I went away for a bit and thought, OK, what's the least that I can do in this situation? And that was to answer some of these questions that they're going to have for the rest of their lives, and then at least try and make some kind of positive changes. And so. I went, I went to go meet them, and I had to hear some really difficult things. I had to hear what it was like for, for them to sit by their son's hospital bed and come to the decision to turn off the life support machine. I had to hear, you know, the little things that they did for him at his funeral. He was a trainee paramedic. And they, they had paramedics there with the motorbikes taking him to, you know, on the, in the procession. And just some really, really st things where you've, you've basically got to be a sicko. You've actually got to be mentally troubled if that doesn't affect you and that doesn't shake you down to your core. And I made a vow then that I will turn my life around and that I will, 
you know, make a positive change and try and make something of my life. And so I decided to go into education. And in education, the reason I'd dropped out of two schools um, was because I didn't care about education. I didn't think it could benefit me at all. And so my, the way, my mindset towards education was all negative. They, they labeled me with dyslexia, they labeled me with ADHD, loads of other stuff that you know, I don't even know about, probably. <laughs> and, but I was determined to make something of myself. And so I'd studied psychology, English, and maths GCSEs. And I sat there with, you know, 16, 17, 16 year olds. And um, here was me, 20 years old, just out of jail, sat there like, mm, what's this going to be like? But hopefully I can get something from it. And then I realized that because I wanted to develop as a person, I'd realized that I'd been left so far behind, you know, I couldn't write properly. I couldn't, you know, do basic numerical sums or you know, work out my change properly when I was at the, at the store. And I was like, you know what, now I realize what education is about because w there's been a discrepancy between education and learning. And I realized that, you know what, I want to learn. I want to develop as a person because I realize now how far behind I felt and how much bad things have happened because I didn't have the right attitude in school. And I didn't have the right attitude, you know, about myself. All of a sudden, I was thinking about how I can get right with me and how I can, you know, become a better person. So I amazingly ended up getting an A star in English and an A star in psychology and a C in maths and everyone was like, what the hell has he done? <laughs> and then, uh, But it, was, but it was David and Joan, you know, who I had to thank for this because they'd sparked this drive within me and they basically saved my life because if they didn't come forward and have that courage, you know, they've had a tremendous amount of courage to be able to come forward and put those questions to me and hold me to account. I, I owe it to them and I say, you know what, they've saved my life. And at this point, we didn't feel comfortable meeting each other face to face. So we would share messages through mediation over a two and a half year period until it got to the point where eventually I managed to get a university place. Um, but before that, you know, a lot of bad things still happened because a lot of people like to judge. A lot of people like to judge people, you know, and sometimes what I realised and what kept me going is that the people who had been harmed the most in my story were the ones that judged me the least. And I just like to say that that's an important message going forward that, you know, don't be too quick to judge someone, you know, because sometimes that's only going to add more pressure onto that person. And challenge the status quo, challenge yourselves. And because of their courage and because they didn't judge me and because they supported me, I felt comfortable going at any challenge that was set against me. So the first huge challenge was my criminal record. How am I going to disclose that with employers? How am I going to, you know, get people to accept me and, and trust me? You know, I'm constantly trying to prove, you know, you can trust me. You know, please do give me a chance. And it's because of the process that, I, that I've took part in restorative justice that makes me, I fully know that I'm going to get where I want to go. There's nothing that can stop me. And unfortunately, my mum took what happened to me quite badly. And she passed away um, due to stress and, and a bit of depression. And, um, you know, that was a key moment where I could have just folded. But I said, you know what, no. You know, I owe it, you know, to the people that aren't here anymore. I owe it to David, I owe it to Joe, but most importantly, I owe it to myself, you know, to push through everything that's thrown in my way. And, to, and, to, and because I've now I've got that reason, I've got that reason to change, I've got that motivation. And eventually, when I got the chance to meet David and Joe face to face, I not only wanted to say 
sorry, which I did, and it was so hard to do, to walk into that room with them. But I also wanted to say thank you, because without them coming forward, I would probably still be in prison now, or worse. And so they saved my life. And because they're not able, and I don't want to speak on their behalf, the next clip I'm going to show you is from when I met David and a few things he had to say. You'll get very upset about the fact that James has died. It's very, very hard for us. And that will never, ever go away. It can't. But I'm not eaten up with the anger the same. And I've not got the frustration because you've given me all the answers. The fact that you're doing so much to try and make something of your life, James would want that because that's the sort of person he was. So for us, you know, supporting you on this is, is important. And to, to see them face to face and to get that support from them, you know, I hope you can like, kind of see how restorative justice, you know, can inspire someone who's lost all hope, lost all self-esteem, and, you know, doesn't really have, you know, everyone wrote me off. Everyone has said, you know what, he's gone way too far now. You know, he's, he's gone to prison for murder. That's it. You know, he's, he's, he's write him off. And, you know, through restorative justice, I was able to be brought back, you know, from the brink. And, um, yeah, it kind of seems quite surreal to be talking about all of that and to be where I am now because I've completely changed my way of thinking. And I guess I would like to end it with, you know, a few words from Joan who, just before I gave, came up on stage to give this, she joined Twitter, and I'd been with her yesterday, delivering a speech on a stage side by side with her, to spread awareness that, you know, one punch can kill, and that anybody can turn it around, no matter how bad, you know, your life situations are, and how bad things have got. And she sent me a tweet just before I came on, and she said, good luck, Jacob. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's just crazy. Um, well, here's a few words from her. I mean, I just see him as a young lad that hit James, and it's a man that sat next to me. You know, he's grown up, he's, he's done so much in those last two or three years, and he's had to. If I can help him change things, and if we can get this message across, we can change it for other people. And that seems like a fitting note to end it on, because I'm um, out of time. But one thing I would encourage you all to do is, you know, put yourselves first. Don't let all this other stuff get you down. It's so easy to get lost within ourselves. Do your best at whatever you apply yourself at. And failure isn't a negative thing. I've, I've, you can't fail much more than I have, you know? And, but you learn from it. And if you go through life succeeding at everything you do, that is amazing, you know? And I hope you can do that. But failure and putting yourself outside of your comfort zone and standing up on stages like this and doing things that make you feel uncomfortable is where you really learn about yourself. And so what I'd ask you all to do is push the boundaries and, you know, go at life with everything you've got. Thank you.